So here's what happens with long-term PPI use. So medications like proton pump inhibitors, also known as PPIs, are often used to treat acid reflux, gastroesophageal reflux, or GERD, and they work quite well because they reduce your stomach acid production down to almost zero. So you're going to get really quick relief, and that's great in the short term, but have you considered what some of the downstream effects are from taking these medications? Like what are they actually doing in our digestive tract and what are some of the knock-on secondary effects of what's occurring in our digestive tract when we take these medications long-term? My name is Dr. Taranella and I want to use my 15 plus years of clinical practice to help you improve and optimize your health. Today we'll explore what research and my clinical experience has shown happens with long-term PPI use. We'll look at both how and why these can and do disrupt multiple systems in our body and some alternatives to consider when you have acid reflux and you need to keep that under control. All right, let's look at the effects of long-term PPI use. Many people make the mistake that because PPIs are so commonly used, so commonly prescribed, that they must be safe. They must be fine for everyone to use for indeterminate duration. And most of the time, they're going to be prescribed when you start having some burning pain, indigestion type of symptoms. And you go see your doctor and tell them about this, and they write you the prescription, and they work quite well. And so they're going to reduce that problem that you're having. And of course, this is perfectly fine and reasonable for the short term meaning a couple weeks, maybe even as much as two or three months. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is with long-term use. PPIs and acid-reducing medicines in general are going to fundamentally change the environment in the stomach, and they're going to also have downstream effects as well, meaning in the intestines and even throughout the body. In particular, they're going to change how we absorb vitamins, change our fundamental defense system in our intestines, and they can also disrupt critical systems in our body, like the cardiovascular system and kidneys, as we will see when we look at some of the research. And we, when we don't understand and consider these downstream and secondary effects of these medicines were solving one problem but creating five or sometimes even six other ones down the road. And that is a fundamental problem with the medicine-based approach in general. Oftentimes it's a quick, easy fix, but it can sometimes create a lot more problems if you're not careful. So let's look at some of the details of these downstream effects and what some of the research has to say about it as well. So when you take PPIs or proton pump inhibitors, as they're commonly referred to, they're going to block or reduce your stomach acid from producing somewhere around 80 to 90 percent of the acid that generally is produced there. And that's great. It's going to ease some of the symptoms of acid reflux, and sometimes you need that temporarily. But we have to understand that stomach acid does a lot more than just help with breakdown of our food. It's also fundamentally important for absorbing or extracting micronutrients from that food. So things like magnesium, iron, B12, calcium, and even others are going to be slowly going down. And that's assuming that you're consuming enough on a regular basis and that your food has ample supply of these. So the lack of acid, yes, it means a reduction in the breakdown of your food, but it also means a reduction in the nutrient absorption and assimilation of those nutrients into your tissues where they're going to be needed and used. And that's some of the secondary effects that we want to look at. Yes, there's a problem with the breakdown of the food when, you, when you're when you taking these PPIs, but there's also a problem with not extracting the vitamins and nutrients from the food as well. And then there's the problems that happen from the insufficient nutrients. And oftentimes we don't make that connection of problem with my health must be a nutrient deficiency. Nutrient deficiency must be from the PPI. So for example, with decreased calcium, it can lead to obviously weakening of your bones, which can ultimately lead to osteoporosis. Lack of B12 absorption, well, could lead to neuropathy in your nerves, sometimes even problems with red blood cell formation. Iron deficiency obviously is going to affect red blood cell formation as well. Magnesium deficiency can affect your muscles and plays a role in so many different aspects of our health, including sleep and even metabolism. So as you can see, the nutrient malabsorption or the vitamin malabsorption that can happen from long-term PPI use can set off a cascade of problems. And if you're not paying attention and if these levels aren't being followed and checked, you may be put on more medications to deal with these 
additional problems, but there's actually other issues that these PPIs can create as well. So when you're taking a proton pump inhibitor, as I said, it's going to reduce the acid production by somewhere of 80 to 90 percent. And that's going to disrupt the natural barrier systems that your body uses to protect against harmful bacteria. So the lower acidity in the stomach is going to translate into lower acidity in the small intestine as well. And that's going to create a more hospitable environment for certain types of bacteria that we wouldn't necessarily want in too much abundance. Small amounts are fine, but when they're allowed to grow and proliferate, those types of bacteria can cause more problems. And this is why Clostridium difficile, or C. diff as it's commonly referred to, is often associated higher incidence of this problem are associated with long-term chronic PPI use. There's also potential problems with the cardiovascular system. So research published in circulation research has found an association of PPIs inhibiting nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, if you don't know, is important for dilating the arteries, which is important when you have some kind of blockage or day to day when you're just going out for a run or doing some more physical activity, you want to be able to dilate those arteries a little bit more to deliver the blood to different tissues throughout your body. So without a constant supply or sufficient supply of that nitric oxide, you might get a little more stiffening of the arteries and that could raise your risk for high blood pressure, heart disease, and other problems associated with high blood pressure. And again, it's the long-term effects of these medicines that are going to do this short-term use, probably not going to have this problem. So if you made it this far, you might be wondering, okay, I guess I need to get off these. How do I go about it? Well, not so fast there, because sometimes when you have been using these medicines for longer periods of time, you can get into a problem with hypersecretion of acid. That means when you try to reduce the acid blockers, you're going to start producing more acid than you were even before you were on them. And that's going to make it more difficult to stop, more difficult to get off of these. And we'll discuss some ways to approach getting off proton pump inhibitors and acid blockers in general. But before we do that, and just to have like some deeper context on the importance of getting off of these, I want to cover some specific research papers looking at the long-term effects of PPI use. So we're going to cover six main topics in terms of research papers and research that supports six main areas. Uh, some of them are going to overlap for sure. The big thing is the nutrient deficiencies, and that's number one. And just want to highlight a study in JAMA that found that people taking PPIs tend to have much more nutrient deficiencies, and that's for extended periods of time. And in this particular study, they found that they had lower levels of magnesium and vitamin B12. And in some cases, the magnesium deficiency was severe enough to cause hospitalization. And it's not just B12 and magnesium. These medicines have been shown to create deficiencies in other vitamins too, as we mentioned, calcium, zinc, iron, and even sometimes vitamin C. And as we said, these have downstream effects, these vitamin deficiencies on our health. Because after all, these vitamins are essential for our well-being. We need enough of them, and some, some of us need even more than the bare minimum RDA because of genetic alterations, etc. So the next thing we want to look at is bone fracture risk and the increased incidence of bone fracture risk with PPIs. And of course, bone fracture risk is one of the most common cause of death as we get older. And the incidence of PPI use actually goes up as we get older too. So research published in the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research showed that those that were taking PPIs had a 30 to 40 percent increased risk of bone fracture. And this was in particular hip fractures, and it was thought to be, of course, associated with the reduced absorption of calcium from taking these PPIs long term. Even without this, older adults are at risk for osteoporosis and, as a result, hip fracture as well. Number three is infection risk, and this is mostly related to the digestive track related infections or increased production of certain bacteria. As we mentioned, the particular bacteria called Clostridium difficile is allowed to thrive in the presence of decreased acid coming from the stomach. And that's partially because the stomach acid is keeping some of those bugs in check as it kind of floods into the small intestine. So it just creates a more hospitable environment for those microbes to thrive. And these are generally going to be like gram-negative bacteria. And while C. diff or Clostridium difficile isn't super common for people to get infected with that, it is more common as you get older. But something like IBS is more common in, in post-infectious IBS as well. But the whole idea with taking PPIs is that you're 
in terms of infection and digestive issues is that you're reducing the acid in the downward movement of the food throughout your digestive tract, which just creates a lot of fermentation and a much more hospitable environment for all kinds of bacteria. So SIBO as well is also commonly associated with PPI use. So the fourth one has to do with the research article in Circulation Research that showed that PPIs are going to reduce nitric oxide production, leading to potentially all kinds of downstream effects on your blood pressure and cardiovascular risk as well. This was noted especially in people that had more long-term use. And the fifth one has to do with kidney health, and a study published in JAMA Internal Medicine found that those that are taking PPIs long-term were associated with a 20 to 50% increased risk of chronic kidney disease. And again, this could be related to the blood pressure, nitric oxide issue, but they associated it here with magnesium. And of course, magnesium also helps with blood pressure and helps relax those arteries. And so you can see that these vitamin deficiencies are probably causing secondary knock-on effects that are going to create these other problems in our health, especially when they go on long-term. And then the last one I wanted to cover, which is probably the most prominent and most cited problem from PPIs is the increased risk of dementia. And I think this is probably related to the decreased absorption of B12. It has to be cleaved from the protein in order to absorb it into our bodies. And so if we have less acid production, that's part of the mechanical thing that allows for the proteins to be degraded to allow the B12 to then be broken off of those proteins. So I think there's probably two, maybe three main underlying mechanisms here. Of course, the lack of breakdown and and specifically being able to degrade things in a more nuanced way. With the acid production, you're getting a large mechanical breakdown of things, which then you get a more refined breakdown lower down in the small intestine. If you don't get that bigger mechanical breakdown, you can't do the more refined breakdown, and that's going to lead to the nutrient deficiencies. I also think the microbiome effects are pretty profound here, and I see this in my practice as well. People have more digestive issues the longer they're on PPIs. So if you're taking PPIs, maybe you're a little bit concerned about some of these long-term effects, and maybe you should be. And I have a few courses that may be able to help you with this process, definitely help you improve your digestion and gain a better awareness of what's going on, what's driving certain problems, and what you can do about it. So one of them is called Digestive Reset. It's kind of a more of an overview of the digestive tract and some things you can do to optimize things. And it definitely talks about acid reflux. And the other one has more to do with post-infectious IBS. And it looks more at SIBO and things related to post-infectious IBS. For those that need more personal guidance, I do have one-on-one. -on -one. You can reach out to our office to schedule an appointment. And we're going to get to some actionable things you can do right now. Before we do that, just let me summarize here quickly. So long-term PPI use is definitely linked with vitamin deficiencies like calcium, zinc, magnesium, vitamin B12, iron, vitamin C, and a few others, which can lead to these downstream effects. Reduced stomach acid is going to lead to bacterial overgrowth and intestinal problems like IBS, post-infectious IBS, and even acute gastroenteritis with something like C. diff or other microbes. Research does suggest that long-term PPI use can affect things like your cardiovascular system, your kidneys, lead to increased bone fracture risk, and even dementia. So again, it's more of the long-term use that's going to cause these problems short term, you're probably okay. And if you're in the category of being on these for more than two, three months, you want to talk to your doctor about a plan of getting off of these. You may not actually need to be on them long term. For instance, I have many patients that have been on them for years and I explain the risks of taking these and they just decide to stop them under my guidance and in some specific instructions and they do fine. They don't have any rebound acid reflux. They basically just stop taking them and they're all good. In these cases, too, you do have to be careful about something known as silent reflux. So this is when you have acid reflux still occurring, but you don't actually feel it. In long term, that acid can create problems in the esophagus called Barrett's esophagitis. So you want to be mindful if you have some changes occurring in your esophagus as a result of taking these PPIs. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't try or shouldn't consider looking into coming off of these. Some other options that I often explore, at least initially with my patients that have more severe acid reflux, is switching to something like an H2 blocker. These are going 
going to have less of a global effect. They're, they're often associated with less of these problems compared to the PPIs. But again, they are reducing the acid still and they still can cause these problems. So not ideal, but better than the stronger PPIs. And sometimes when we're making those transitions, I'll have people take some supportive herbs and supportive things that are going to help reduce the irritation and discomfort. So things like Slippery Elm is a good product and there's other products too. I'll put a link in the description to ones that I use. So these are just some of the things that I think about when I'm considering having someone come off of PPIs. And of course, sometimes there are other things that are creating the acid reflux that we have to look at as well. But that's all I had to share with you in this particular video on what happens with long-term PPI use. If you have any questions about anything in this video, please drop it in the comment section. I'm more than happy to answer your question. If you want a more customized, detailed answer, consider joining the membership program where I'll have more time and attention to dedicate to your question. You can also check out those other courses. And one question you might have after looking at this video is what foods might be triggering my acid reflux or what foods should I avoid if I have acid reflux to try to reduce that problem? And you can find more information on that video right here. Thank you for watching. We will see you next time.